Our last episode was on the New England Confederation, otherwise known as the United Colonies of New England. And the season thus far is really only focused on New England. But if you noticed in the introduction to season three, I said we're going to explore the other English North. Well, in season one, we saw the prehistory of New York. In this season, we focused on New England thus far. We're missing a huge chunk of land, aren't we? Which brings us to the odd tale of Sir Edmund Plowden, sometimes called Ploiden, and his curious colony of New Albion. Plowden was born into a well-to-do family of scholars who were staunch Catholics. Not the easiest thing to be at the time in England. Nevertheless, his extended family became known for being strong royalists, and they married into the royal court under King James I. One exception being a second cousin of his whom we've already met, the Lord Say and Seal, quite a powerful man himself and clearly a parliamentarian. He was one of the designers of the Saybrook colony as well as one of the leaders of the Council for New England. And then beyond his own family, he married quite well and inherited from his wife's father a lot of land and wealth. And so surrounding him, frankly, were people who were much better than him, much more talented, much more able to do things. People who managed to accomplish something in their lives. And yet Plowden was not known for any accomplishments. He wasn't even known as a good guy. There is one instance recorded where he actually beat a pregnant tenant of his in an attempt to illegally force her from her lease. And over the course of his lifetime, Edmund will accumulate somewhere in the vicinity of a hundred plus lawsuits both brought by him and by others onto him. He is the protagonist of this episode, but do not feel inclined to like him. But by 1630, he had amassed enough land to qualify for knighthood, and so he became an Irish knight, the Kingdom of Ireland being the within the realm of Charles I, the son of James I. And so he became a knight without any acts of valor, without any feats at war, without protecting anyone whatsoever. It's after this point that Plowden now gets it in his mind that he is going to start a colony of his own in the New World. The first time he expresses this desire in a petition to King Charles is in 1632. Now, if you recall from decades previous, the lower latitudes of the English claim was originally controlled, after 1606 anyway, by the Virginia Company of London. That would be the company that created Jamestown. The Powhatan in 1622 launched a devastating attack against the people of Jamestown and the surrounding settlements of the young Virginia colony. It was so devastating, in fact, that within two years, the king rescinds their charter, citing their native relations, mismanagement, and the seemingly missing thousands of immigrants who left England not to be accounted for in Virginia. Virginia then becomes a royal colony. Now, the more northerly latitudes were given over in 1606 to a group called the Virginia Company of Plymouth. They would be directly responsible for the Popham colony and then indirectly supportive of Plymouth, later reorganized as the Council for New England. Coming up on 1634-35, the council had become defunct. And yet there was still a Virginia and there was still a New England. There were English people planted there. Their charters had an overlapping middle section. Now, what happened in that middle section is that the Dutch moved in and New Netherland, the subject of the first season of this podcast, willingly filled the void. But that does not mean that the English overall had voided their claim to the area. And Charles I, in desperate need of money, saw in Lord Edmund Ploiden, or Plowden, a fantastic money grab in return for giving Plowden some sense of achievement or accomplishment or recognition. And so knowing these middle latitudes were already occupied by a foreign power, King Charles I, July 24th, 1634, issues a grant of land to Sir Edmund Ploiden and the Knights of New Albion, which would extend from Long Island all the way down to Cape May, which actually overlapped with the Maryland colony. The English grants of James and his son Charles, they often overlapped each other, as I've probably said that word five times already. Now, there are several reasons to for this. First of all, it could have been bad record keeping, bad map making, 
But the more nuanced view I've heard from historians is to ensure the settlement of the land they built in a little competition even between English entities. In other words, whoever establishes themselves there, they get the land. And this would be a friendly competition because Maryland is also an English Catholic colony ran by the Lord Baltimore, also an Irish peer, much like Lord Plowden. Plowden's charter made him a hereditary governor, an Earl Palatine of this place called New Albion. Curious thing here, just about the naming of the place. New Albion is just another way of saying New Scotland. It's also the exact name of Sir Francis Drake's English colony on the west coast of the North American continent many decades before, if you can call it a colony at all. But also, this colony, New Albion, New Scotland, will come to share its name with the Earl of Stirling's colony of Nova Scotia, which again is just another way of saying New Scotland. It goes to show that perhaps King Charles I didn't take New Albion that seriously, whereas Maryland could firmly be founded where the Dutch were not yet settled. New Albion was a Catholic offshoot or little brother of Maryland that might possibly be able to root out the Dutch from the different crevices that it inhabited, which included at the time the Delaware River, all the way through the Hudson River, and over to the Connecticut River. And one provision in the charter provided no exemption for the lands already settled by a Christian prince. Many of the other past charters did include this, whereby some basic rights for pre-existing Christian settlements would be recognized. The New Albion Charter didn't have this. It was clearly meant, if for nothing else, to keep the English paper claim to New Netherland still fresh. But again, it was probably just intended to be a paper empire to King Charles. Something that was specified in the charter that with these extraordinary powers that Sir Edmund Ployden or Plowden would receive, it would receive no royal funding whatsoever, nor advisement or oversight. An entity fully designed to annoy the Dutch while also costing King Charles the least amount of his time and attention and resources. A charter that even if King Charles didn't take it seriously, bestowed a lot of power upon uh, Plowden. The historians Edward Carter II and Cliff Lewis III say of it, Plowden's New Albion Charter was perhaps, next to the Maryland Charter, the most powerful bestowal of authority in British North America. Easy to do when Plowden's colony is at this point, completely fictional and hypothetical. After this point, Edmund Plowden does very little to actually create a colony, but he spends eight years meticulously crafting a plan of government and design for New Albion, wherein he styles himself Edmund by divine providence, Lord Proprietor, Earl Palatine, Governor and Captain General of the province of New Albion. His capital would be centrally located somewhere in modern-day New Jersey, so halfway between Maryland and Long Island, roughly, in terms of latitude, and would be named Wachesset, likely gleaned from a Native American place name. Under him, as he ruled from his capital, his 17 children would all receive hereditary titles of nobility. His son Francis, for instance, would have become governor and baron of Mount Royal of New Albion, where his son Thomas would have become High Admiral and Baron of Roy Mount of New Albion. But all of his children, sons and daughters were made Barons and Baronesses. It's likely at this time that each of his children also received large strips of land on a map that we no longer have. Two lands he had never seen or anyone in his family occupied by people, native and European, who had no allegiance or awareness of him whatsoever. Other than his children becoming Lords of the Land, Sir Edmund Plowden would govern with the help of deputy governors, a secretary of state, and a supreme council. And in his service would be the Knights of Albion, who would be missionary warriors, crusaders of sorts. The full name of the order would be the Knights of Albion for the conversion of the 23 kings. Those 23 kings being what they knew as the chiefs of the Lene Lenape Confederation. Concerning them, I'm going to quote Joseph Sickler from the New Jersey Historical Society. 23 kings were to feel the missionary zeal of Lord Edmund until they should, like the knights, become fervent Christian citizens. If the Indians failed to appreciate his missionary endeavors, 
There was always another way. That was the ever trusty sword. Yes, folks, there's no sugarcoating it. This was to be conversion by friendship or death or conversion by the sword. Now, just a little bit of evidence to this. Sir Edmund Plowden contracted for a banner to be created for the order. And on it featured a native king alive, fully intact with his head, and then 22 without. Again, Edmund is not a good guy. He is our protagonist, but he doesn't have to be your hero. And from 1634, years pass of just inaction, fantasies on paper. In 1637, he separated from his wife. She wanted nothing to do with him. Bishop Laud himself awarded alimony to be paid to her, which he refused to pay and eventually landed him in jail for some portion of the year 1639. New Albion is now a five-year-old fantasy in Sir Edmund Plowden's mind. And yet finally, in August of 1642, Sir Edmund Plowden leaves for the New World. He tried to convince his wife to go with him, but of course, she refused. He carried with him a proclamation made from the king himself that said that any Englishman who settled along the Delaware had to do so with permission from Sir Edmund Plowden, the king's, in quotes, loving cousin. Little will that mean with the oncoming of the English Civil War. He landed in Virginia, and there he just stayed. He brought very few people with him, mostly indentured servants, and nothing on the scale that would be required to enact his master plan of having this grand new Albion to rule over. And so again, he just sat in Virginia. So long, in fact, that his indentured servants actually sued him in the Virginia courts for not fulfilling his end of the master-servant relationship according to their contract. As indentured servant contracts go, they were to receive some sort of compensation at the end of their term, typically three to seven years, usually somewhere in the five-year range. Their promised land could never be delivered to them if their master, Sir Edmund Plowden, never actually manages to settle New Albion. And so the Virginia court ordered Sir Edmund Plowden to settle New Albion or set his servants free, complicating the matter even more in these intervening years where he just stalled and stalled and stalled. Starting in 1638, and you'll find this in the first season of the podcast, Sweden actually forms a colony on the Delaware. It's called New Sweden. Not a very creative name, but businessmen from Sweden hired Peter Minwe, who had been recently fired from the Dutch West India Company as the director of New Netherland to carve out of the New Netherland claim a New Sweden, hopefully in an undeveloped portion of the New Netherland claim where they wouldn't even notice a new colony until they were already well dug in and prepared to defend themselves. That's exactly what Peter Minwe did, and New Sweden was born from the southern portion of New Netherland. So now not only did Sir Edmund Plowden have to subdue the Lene Lenape, have to push aside the Dutch, now the Swedes were likely in the very area he was aiming for. But at this point, his hand had been forced. In May of 1643, he leaves Virginia on a boat with only 16 people, indentured servants to himself. He lands at Varchenskill, where he discovers a small settlement of New Haveners, Englishmen, Puritans from New England, who had settled within the claims of New Sweden. Lord Edmund Plowden, landing with all the pomp and ceremony he could muster, declared that the New Haveners were squatters in his lands. But he, being merciful, would forgive them if only they would now swear allegiance to him and his king. The New Haveners were no fools. They said, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, you're in charge of us, that's fine. Which was enough to get Sir Edmund Plowden to leave. Not really taking this interaction seriously, these New Haveners also offered the nearby Swedes an oath of allegiance. The governor of New Sweden now being Johann Prince. Again, you can hear that story in the first season of this podcast. Well, curiously, they discovered a strange-looking fellow marooned on an island off of Cape Charles one day. The Swedes approached him and discovered that it was none other than Sir Edmund Plowden. What ended up happening is, after leaving the New Haveners, his indentured servants rebelled against him and stranded him on an island. Prince's men rescue him, 
And then they go so far as to track down those indentured servants and hand them back to Plowden, and has the lot of them shipped back to Virginia. After this, Sir Edmund Plowden has the governor of Virginia, Governor Berkeley, write a letter demanding that Governor Prince of New Sweden present any documentation he may have to claim governance over the area that Sir Edmund Plowden called New Albion. Prince beside himself and already having done far too much for Sir Edmund Plowden did not comply and didn't even dignify the request with a reply. And then from 1643, for the next five years or so, he appears to have laid low, made his way back home for a while, until 1648, when he actually publishes a book wherein he titles himself Bouchon Plantagenet, just to give himself a little more royal zeal. The book was called A Description of the Province of New Albion. Not an uncommon thing to do is to publish a book in order to stir up interest in settling these new ventures. In it, he offered 5,000 acres to anyone who could settle 50 people. His messaging for New Albion changed. Eventually, he denies being a Catholic and that the colony had any religious focus whatsoever and was rather an economic endeavor. And if you read copies of the book online, it's clear that he doesn't necessarily have any understanding of what the area actually has in terms of geological features or the people who are there. He insisted that Long Island was not called Long Island, it was called Plowden Island. And after its publication, some sources claim that he Plowden had as many as 450 settlers lined up to actually settle his claim. This would be going into the years 1649 and 1650. But as a royalist, well into uh, the period of time we call the English Civil War, when the parliamentary forces clearly had an upper hand, his plans for New Albion once again fell apart. And there's no evidence that any of his proposed colonists ever actually made their way to New Albion, which leads to a dismal 1650s for Sir Edmund Plowden. He spends the decade writing threats to the governors of New Sweden and trying to lodge protests with the States General over in the Netherlands. However, with the outbreak of the First Anglo-Dutch War, there was little headway in that direction. Personally, by the end of 1654, Plowden's wife finally was granted a divorce. Again, he had to pay an even greater amount of alimony, and again he didn't pay it, and again he ended up back in jail. And then in July of 1659, Sir Edmund Plowden dies, allegedly still in debtor's prison. His entire life a strange farce. And yet in his miserable, immoral life, did he sprinkle a few seeds that led to anything? In the early 1660s, not too long after Sir Edmund died, the monarchy was restored and the new King Charles II received letters from New Haveners who referenced Sir Edmund Plowden's rights and from the shareholders of Sir Edmund's own New Albion venture, reminding him that New Netherland still existed in defiance of a legitimate claim to the land made by his father through the Kingdom of Ireland. And before the end of the decade, New Netherland was taken by the English and given to the brother of the king, the Duke of York, the future King James II. Now, the Dutch did briefly retake it in the 1670s. The colonies of New York and New Jersey became New Netherland again. Afterward, the new Albion Charter was referenced in 1675 in today what we would call a title history of the Duke of York's grant, re-legitimizing a newly taken New York and New Jersey, and speeding ahead quite a bit here. The new Albion patent remained in the Plowden or Ploiden family for generations. From Edmund, it went to Thomas, then it went to Thomas's son Francis, until the 1770s when it landed in the lap of a great-great-grandson by the name of Francis, who over a hundred years after New Albion ceased its even short and tenuous existence, revived the New Albion colony, now firmly the New Jersey colony, and he referred to himself as the 5th Earl Palatine of New Albion, likely simply as a way to have the colony of New Jersey buy out his claim or compensate him in some form. Well, the entire thing was for naught because of a little event called the American Revolution. I don't know if you've heard of it. And so you would think that the creation of the United States would finally put New Albion to bed and the Knights of New Albion. Well, 
Nay, nay, because moving into the 1780s, Francis Ployden sells his claims to New Albion to a lawyer by the name of Charles Varlow, who travels to the new state of New Jersey in the United States of America and tries to obtain back rent from people living on lands claimed by the Plowden family, claiming that if they would only pay him a small fee, he would provide them with a clean title to their land and thus avoid being sued by the Plowden family. Little is known on how effective Varlow was out of scamming people out of their money, but this is truly the final death of the colony of New Albion, a colony that barely existed in the first place, created to irritate the Dutch, and at its very end used to scam farmers in New Jersey out of their hard-earned money. For me personally, the most curious and interesting part of this entire story is Sir Edmund Plowden's plan of government. His cockamamie ideas harkening back to a feudal past that even in 17th century England was quickly dissipating. Could you imagine Edmund showing up on the beaches of what is now New Jersey, somehow having mustered the resources with thousands of settlers in a group of English Catholic knights who styled themselves the Knights of New Albion, attacking the Swedes, the Dutch, and the Lene Lenape, all in the name of the King of England and spreading the Catholic faith. It would have been a disaster. But for you fans of alternative history, there is fertile ground here for wild speculation that all originated within the mind of Sir Edmund Ployden in his self-aggrandizing fantasies wherein he would no longer be the underachieving black sheep of his family. But this episode introduces us to the area of New Jersey, which in our next episode we will learn about a little bit, but New Jersey is not one of the other states of America, of course, right? Because New Jersey is still a very lovely state, part of our union. But there will come a time in the history of colonial New Jersey when it was split into East and West, and that falls firmly within the purview of this podcast. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.